We know generally that we're not saved by works. We know that, that we're saved by faith. But we even try to make faith out to be the one good work that's required of us. Where are you going with us? Faith is not willpower. If willpower is involved, it is not faith. Faith does things, faith works, but it's faith doing the works. Matter of fact, faith is a person, Mr. Faith. You can't pump up God. <laughs> you basically have two main streams in the church. You have, and I don't want to try to, I'm just loosely using some labels here, and you have this massive theological debate that's gone on for 500 years, okay? You have Arminian kind of guys. What that basically means is they believe that Jesus died for everybody. True. But they believe since he died for everybody, it's up to you to choose him. You, your faith, your decision. Oh, my decision saves me. I thought the Bible says his decision saved me. Come on, that's right. I didn't choose him, he chose me. I can take no credit. It is absolutely by grace. Amen? And so then you have another stream, which would be like hyper-Calvinism. <laughs> now they know that you can't save yourself. They know it's not up to your choice, your decision. They know that it was his decision. They know it is by grace and that not of yourselves. And so the emphasis is not on what you have to do. And so they say, look, it's totally grace. God chose you. True, true, true. Amazing. Awesome. Right? But what they can't account for, well, if you're chosen, then why is this guy not chosen? If God is in charge, then he must pick some for heaven and he must pick some for hell. And you get into this double predestination thing. I'm giving you some happy theology because bad theology wrecks your buzz, okay? <laughs> Don't be afraid of theology, be afraid of bad theology, okay? And so they think God is sitting up in heaven at the beginning of time making these arbitrary decrees, making these random decrees. This one's in, this one's out. I don't like the face on him. He looks good. Okay, he's in, he's out. He's in, he's going to heaven, he's going to hell. And they think God is making arbitrary decrees in the beginning because it's a bad reading of Romans 9 through 11, which is basically just was a, a rabbit trail Paul was taking between there's no condemnation for those in Christ and all of Israel will be saved. And Romans 9 through 11 is the most landmine area for an unwary interpreter to go through. Do not get caught up in some weird twisted thing thinking that God is choosing some for heaven and some for hell. This is the truth. Let's look at it through the lens of the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the ultimate text. Anytime you look at the Bible, you're not looking at the words on the page. You've got to see Christ, 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 and Him crucified. You study this and in five you will be saved. But it all points to me. Look at Him. He is the Word of God. This is not the Word of God. He is the Word of God. Jesus is the decree of the Father. What does that mean? That means Jesus is the chosen one. Jesus is the predestined one. Jesus is the elect one. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. From the dawn of creation, it is all been Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. Say all. all. In heavenly places in Christ, according as he, is it me choosing him? No. He has chosen us. Say he's chosen us. Wait a minute, what's this? What are these two words? In Him. Before the foundation of the world. That we should be holy and without blame. Say, I'm holy. I'm without blame. Having predestined us to the adoption of children 
by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of your will, no, his will, to the praise and glory of his grace where he has made us accepted in the beloved. Say, I am accepted in the beloved. In whom we have obtained an inheritance. Say, I have obtained it. Being predestined according to the purpose of who? Him. Who works all things after the counsel of His own will. The scriptures say you are predestined in Him. You are chosen in Him. You are elect in Him. Because He is the elect one. He is Neo. He is the chosen one. He is the Messiah. Thing is, at the end of the day, you're going to be in Him whether you like it or not. You can resist and you can resist and you can resist. Who resisted the most? The Israelites. The Israelites resisted the most but it's difficult to be anti-Semitic because their resistance bought the salvation of the world. They killed Him. So we could all be cracked. <laughs> the more you resist, the more he's glorified. <laughs> that's why Paul had to say, now should we continue to sin so that the glory keeps coming? No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying sin so that more glory comes, but no matter what happens, more glory is coming. There is a type of double predestination but it's a double predestination in Him. Whether for judgment or for glory, whether for crucifixion or resurrection. You see, you can sit in the corner with that little Burger King hat on and you can pretend this party is not going on, but this party ain't gonna stop. Even hell, hell, I believe in, I believe every scripture about hell, but one thing I will not do, I will not locate it outside the sovereign realm of grace. Grace, at the end of the day, is sovereign over all. You see? Luke chapter 16. I'll just paraphrase this. It's the parable of the prodigal son. And we could change the name of this parable. We could call it the father who lost two sons. Because really, the, the prodigal was not the only bad boy in the parable. Matter of fact, all the parables are uh, misnamed. Like we say, the parable of the lost sheep. Show me one sheep who was never lost. Nothing remarkable about a lost sheep. It's really about the good shepherd. See? The parables have been misnamed. This parable really is the parable of the good father. And if you really want to look at what this parable is about, you could call it the parable of the fatted calf. Because what's your favorite part of that whole parable? Is when he cranks the party music on, isn't it? And the father rolls out the fatted calf. You know who the fatted calf is, right? There we go, that's my like it. Now we think that this is a parable about repentance. Did you know I haven't found any any repentance so far in the parable of what we call the prodigal son? Where's your repentance at? Oh, the prodigal son repented. He did not repent. <laughs> He's slaving away, and he's wishing he could eat the pig food, and so he goes home to eat pig food. If that's repentance, that is one shabby excuse of repentance. All you're doing to go is feed your, your own belly on pig food. And you look at, the, you look at the, 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 the speech that he had rolled up in his pocket, right? Look what the prodigal says. He says, you know, I've been a bad boy. True. He says, I've wasted your inheritance, you know, on women of the night or whatever, you know? True. Wasted it all. Terrible. 
Do you know this is really a parable about death and resurrection? Back it up a few steps. The prodigal is begging for his inheritance. And so what does a father do? He's basically saying, I want you to roll over and I want you to croak. I want you to die and give me my inheritance. So just give me my inheritance now. And so really in Titan Shadow, the father's already died. He's already given the inheritance to the sons. Look at the elder brother, the one who's complaining in the end of the story. The whole farm is his. Younger brother gets the cash. Older brother gets the farm. And so you have the father just sitting on a rocking chair on the porch that isn't even his. He's already given it to the elder brother. It's already his. It's already yours. And so here, the prodigal, he wants some pig food. And so he says, I was a bad boy. True. I wasted your money. True. But then he says, one other thing is not going to fly. He says, if I go home, if you would just make me like one of your servants, your servants always have bread left over, right? He's, he, that was the one part that he got wrong. But you look at this, before the prodigal ever, ever pulled out his confession speech. Did you know confession does not save you? That's right, that's right, that's right. <laughs> Confession is a response to the forgiveness you've already received. Before he ever gets to speech out of his pocket, the father gets up, he sees him from a distance. And now here's the son who was out in the far country, and now he too has died. And the father runs, and the father embraces him. And he says, the son of mine who is dead is alive. And he tries to get his speech out. He says, I wasted your money, yeah. Then, he, then the confession comes after he's already accepted. So, I wasted your money. I, 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 I was a bad boy. But he never got the last part of the speech out of his mouth. I'll be a slave in your house. When he felt the father's embrace, he knew that that kind of stuff was not going to fly around here. And so the father says, bring out the fatted calf. <laughs> and so they roll out the fatted calf and the party music starts and the disco lights come on. <laughs> What happens is the elder brother, he goes outside and he starts pouting. Matter of fact, he says he's right there. He's right there. The party's going on all around him. And he walks outside sucking his thumb. And when you look at the elder brother, what you're seeing is you're seeing God's position toward the damned. That's what you're seeing. The party's going on and he refuses. He says, you never did this for me. He said, look, this was already yours. I've already given you everything. You got 5,200 head of cattle you could have killed any time you want. It's already yours. What are you pouting about? And he says, look what you did for that son of yours. What do you call this brother? What do you do with that son of, for that son of yours? See? And what do you see? You see that this parable, it ends abruptly. That's all we know. For 2,000 years, we haven't seen the end of that parable. What do we know about hell? What do we know about hell? It could feasibly last forever. Sure. How, to whatever degree it's populated, who knows? But there you go. Open-ended. We don't know. But I'll tell you one thing. Where's the father at? The father is out there pleading with him the whole time. That's right. And you never see the father come back in without him. That's the, that's the image of Christ preaching to those souls in prison. You see, we don't know. You can, you can have your hell, have your party, I can cry if I want to, cry if I want to. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
I know that Christians get mad when you try to take that hell away from them that they love and know so dearly. I'm not doing that. You can, you, listen. Heaven and hell are both full of forgiving sinners. Some accept their already given gift of acceptance. If you want to resist it, there is no stronger imagery than fire and brimstone for that kind of stupidity. <laughs> but even if I go to the depths of Sheol, Psalm 139, there you are. Like what George and Banoff says about hell, hell is like your eyes are closed and you're in this state of just delusional, God's not here, God's not here, God's not here. How are you gonna run? He takes up all the space. <laughs> saying there's no hell. What I'm saying is we've improperly defined it and we've made God the enemy of the damned when all along he's the savior of the damned. All along he's been trying to woo Adam out of the bushes. Where are you buddy? Let's play. It's time to play. Jump in here. Here we go. Let's swing on those vines. Let's ride a monkey. Let's ride a <laughs> Oh my goodness. I just want you to see how good he is. See how good he is. You gotta get this inside of you guys. You gotta know. Jesus did not come. This is what he says. He says in the book of John, he says, the Father judges no one, but has given all authority to the Son. Right? So who's the judge? Jesus. And this is what Jesus says in another passage in John. I think it's in John 5. One of them is. He said, I did not come to judge the world, but to save it. <laughs> What's going on here? <laughs> See, there's a scandal going on here. Is that we have this judge whose whole shtick is non-judgment. <laughs> And who is somehow got this rigged trial and jury. He is in cahoots with these guilty sinners. Yeah. <laughs> and so we see that in in in, in the end of at the in, 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 in the in the in the evening of time that all the losers and all the crackheads and all the half lazy plumbers and all the we just everybody. He's basically rolling up to the same table, getting the same sentence that says it's Miller time. No matter how they work, no matter how hard they work, no matter how late they showed up in the day, the guys who've been working all day are going to be peeved. Everybody opens their envelope, same paycheck. The guys who showed up like 15 minutes before the, the, the end of the day, they're, you know, they're, first of all, they're just going to be like, whoa, don't tell them about that Hawaii trip. Don't, don't show everybody else. It mobbed me if they knew I got paid the same. So at the end of the day, everybody's getting the same judgment handed out, which is non-judgment. Everybody's getting what they don't deserve. If you insist, if you demand to get what you do deserve, you can have it. I think it's time we stop making hell God's fault. He came to save a world that had already condemned itself. Just grab your neighbor by the nose. Oh my goodness, I am hammered, drunk on this message of absolute, full inclusion. Romans 5. You see, 
you see two paradigms that have some similarity and some absolute difference. You have the one that represents the all. Israel, the elect nation that represented all of humanity. You see? When God looks, he doesn't just see one, he sees all, and he sees one in all and all in one. You have the one man, Adam, whose sin affected all of humanity. And Paul says, if this one guy affected everybody for evil, how much more will the one man, Christ, affect everybody with an overabounding grace? How much more the one representing the all? If I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. He came to take away not the sins of some, but the sins of the world. God was in Christ reconciling the cosmos to himself. All. He represented all of humanity. All of humanity died on that tree. Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, I, the world, I died to the world and the world died to me. That whole world, it wasn't just your old sinful nature that died on that cross. The whole world died on that cross. Behold, all things have become new. Do you have eyes to see it? That's what faith is. Can you trust it? Is it too good to be true? Turn your neighbor, make a drunken noise in their ear again. Make a long drunken noise in their ear. Uh, ha, 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 ha. All in all, all in all. Okay, one more little thing, one more little thing, we're all done. One more little thing, and then we're just gonna, I don't know what you're gonna do. Gonna do. <laughs> Paul comes up to some pagans, say pagans. In Acts 17, 28, say pagans. This is what he says to them. He says to pagans. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being. Just as your old poet said. God didn't start loving you when you became a believer. When you became a believer, that's when you started realizing how much he's loved you all along. There's no such thing as insider or outsider. It's just believer, unbeliever. Do you believe it? As some of your own poets have said, we are his offspring. It's a damper on your holier than thou party, doesn't it? How about this one? Remember old Pete, old Petey boy? Old Peter? In Acts chapter 10, remember this story? He's, he, he's hungry, wants a little snack. He wants a, he wants a little snack, and so he falls into a trance on the rooftop. Remember that? And they're cooking up, and, and, and uh, you know, people say, oh, yes, he was fasting. No, he's hungry. He's just, they're cooking up the meal downstairs, it says. Right? If I fast more, then I'll get drunk in the spirit. If I climb into the heavens. It says he fell into a trance. You trying to get drunk in the spirit, that's called divination. Trying to get filled with the Holy Spirit, divination. I'm not trying to get drunk, I'm believing I already am. Peter sees, he sees all these little strange critters that he's not allowed to eat come down, right? He sees bacon come out of the sky. He sees crab cakes. He sees barbecue shrimp, right? All this stuff that a little Jewish boy is not allowed to eat, right? 
and, and the Lord says, take it, Peter, you better eat. And what did it represent? It represented Peter going out to the nations. Amen? Now, we know that, but we don't know the full extent of it. It says here, Acts chapter 10, verse 28. Listen to this. Peter, the first guy ever to go to a dirty Gentile's house. Unbeliever. Say pagan. Pagan. Goes to the pagan's house. What does he say? He said to them, You are well aware it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. You see, they've already been cleansed. They just don't know it. They've already been forgiven. They just don't know it. They've already been circumcised from that old sinful nature. They just don't even know it. And so they're acting in a false identity. They're acting under the power of a lie. I'm not saying the lie doesn't exist, but I'm saying the lie in itself is an untruth. I see it. Oh my goodness. Are you starting to see how big this work of the gospel actually was? Are you starting to get a little bit of a glimpse? We're not throwing out the foundations of the faith, but what we're saying is this is way bigger than we realize, guys. We've been narrow-minded. We haven't seen how all-inclusive this work is. Oh my goodness, and we are those who tell, who shout it from the rooftop, the revelation of this good news, that there is no longer any separation, no longer enmity, that God has always been for you, that the only enmity is that you are enemies of God in your own minds, Colossians chapter 1, and that God has been made, he has made peace, that the blood of Christ was not to appease or satisfy an angry God, but as Hebrews said, the blood of Christ was sprinkled to cleanse you of a guilty conscience. It's always been for you. Oh my goodness. He's so good. He's a lot better than you are. He's made you as good as him. But he wasn't just abusing his son on the tree so that he would be able to like you. That's hyper penal substitution. You wouldn't even do that to your own kids. That's child abuse. The Father was in Christ. The full Trinity was partaking in that, you see? Not some other God hiding behind Jesus' back. When you look at Him, you see the full heart of the Father. Amen. If you think Jesus could carry the sins, but the Father couldn't look at it, then what you're doing is you're splitting up a Trinity that doesn't have a split. And you're saying that Jesus is okay to handle some sin, but God's not. So Jesus is subservient to God. So Jesus is not God, so you're not a Christian. Should we do that? Yeah. How do you guys want to do it? I don't know how you do it. You mean to do it? Do you guys have cards or whatever? 